February 2017. Following orders, sailors on the Saudi frigate Al Madina navigate close to the Yemeni coast, when suddenly a boat bomb of the Houthi rebels came out of nowhere at more than 100 km per hour. Loaded with half a ton of explosives, the suicide boat approaches the frigate's bow to blow up the propellers. If the propellers destroyed, it will be easier to sink her. Finally, the boat reached its objective. The lives of 180 men depended on luck. So in this video we are going to speak about Iranian inspired asymmetric naval warfare. We are going to speak about guerrilla warfare. Because how can you defeat an enemy navy, in this case an Arab navy, that is much more powerful than me? So that's what the Houthis have been doing. They have been employing naval mines, they have been employing counter amphibious assault tactics, they have been employing anti-ship missiles, and all of that is super interesting. So now, let's begin! <laughs> The Houthi rebels, shown in green on the map, control the capital of Yemen, Sana'a, as well as North Yemen. In contrast, the Arab coalition, led by Saudi Arabia and the Yemen government, controls the Red Territory. Finally, the yellow areas are in hands of the southern separatists, while on some areas, Al-Qaeda and ISIS are present. But what is going on in Yemen waters? And why is naval warfare so important in this war? Why is water so important then? In the end, Yemen is surrounded by water and it has a lot of islands. The Hanis Islands, the Perim Island, the, the Socotra Island, all that stuff is important for the war. It is important to establish naval bases. It is important to establish uh, logistical supply lines for your army because you are going to send a lot of armored vehicles, a lot of ammunition, and that is going to be done by sea and you need, of course, to protect that, right? Arab navies are going to try to use their advantage regarding naval power because in the end they have almost naval supremacy as they are able to operate all kind of, of ships. In the end that operation is not exactly a blockade, it is an, a trolling operation because they don't want to block any kind of ship, they want to register them, they want to intercept them if they are loaded with ammunition or weapons, but they are not going to systematically avoid any kind of ship to reach Yemen, right? That's the difference between an, a patrolling and interception operation and just a naval blockade. The Saudis were smart. They used their overwhelming naval power to cut off Houthi naval supply lines and they used their naval guns to support troops on the ground. Finally, they forced the Houthis to divert forces and defend the entire coastline. In the end, the Houthis are facing an enemy fleet that may do an amphibious assault at any part of the Yemen coastline. So they have to prepare themselves against this threat without having a lot of weapons and a lot of tools to prevent it. What do they have? What did the Yemeni state have? They had some anti-ship missiles, they had some missile boats like the OSA class of Soviet origin and a Chinese variant of it. They are going to have some mines, naval mines, that can be used in order to prepare prepare minefields that avoid the enemy from getting their, their troops inside the, the beaches, but they lack some really advanced or technological resources. In the end, they are going to trust, especially at the beginning, in their traditional weapons, in their ground weapons, once the enemy force has disembarked. The Houthis are kneeling. Soon after the Arab intervention began, the Saudi Air Force launched a bombing campaign against high-value targets including air bases, large arsenals and weapon depots, anti-aircraft units and warships. Within a few weeks, the grey Saudi F-15s had smashed the country's major air bases, annihilated on the ground jet fighters and cargo planes of the Yemen Air Force. They sunk Yemen's main warships in their own dockyards and destroyed bases where radars and anti-ships missiles were stored. That's right. The Houthis were threatened by the Arab naval strategy, so they adapted. The Houthis had some weapons, some tools that they could use against the enemy. For example, they had a bunch of tanks, artillery, howitzers, multiple rocket launchers, anti-tank guided missiles, some recoilless guns, all that kind of, of weaponry. It is not perfect to deal with an enemy warship, but it is true that in certain circumstances you can use those weapons against enemy ships. However, the Houthis didn't have gunners so well trained to do this kind of shooting against an enemy ship on the move, for example. So they decided to use a more traditional tactic, which is just to go back, go in the interior, wait a few kilometers inside the, inside the country and then do counter attacks and wait the enemy amphibious forces to advance. And that's what actually it is in Midi. It is a town located close to Saudi Arabia, it has a small dock that can be used to smuggle weapons and they did some operation there. It is not sure if they came through the ground or if they did an amphibious assault on Midi, but the point is that they took the coastline there and there they got ambushed by the Houthi forces that were waiting them. 
but the Houthis needed weaponry and units specialized on naval fighting. And that's how several incredible initiatives were born to launch a true naval guerrilla. Houthis fight back. The first and most effective tool was the naval mine. Yes, some mines of Soviet origin had survived in the Yemen Navy arsenal and the Houthis have learned to use do-it-yourself mooring mines. Let me remind you that for any modern navy, creating a naval minefield is a slow and hard task that requires the use of a specialized team of divers, drones and minesweepers. And of course, while you are trying to open corridors in the minefields, the enemy is shooting at you from the shore. Oh, and yes, while penetrating the minefields, you are revealing the place where your assault is going to take place. And now, let's see how sophisticated were the Houthi mines. A lot of Houthi mines were just fake mines, because they obstruct very well the, the job of the mine in a field, right? However, the real naval mine that they used that was very typical was the mooring mine. A mooring mine is the typical World War I mine, which has a weight on the seafloor, a chain to link that weight to the naval mine, and a naval mine very close to the surface, or even in the surface. It was in most cases a contact mine, that means that you have touched it with something in order to close an electrical circuit in order to provoke the explosion. Very simple device. It is true that they could have some old Soviet era mines uh, stored in their in the Navy arsenals, but it is not sure. In any case, it is true that they have been producing their own models and there are some documents that speak about much more sophisticated mines in very small numbers. You know, magnetic mines that are able to follow a target, all that kind of things that may have been used for offensive mining, as I will lately explain you what is that. The Houthis placed these minefields in front of the largest port cities threatened by an Arab amphibious operation. Now, refreshing a minefield is not easy. You have to take care of the mine's status, remove some of them and install new ones. You need experienced scuba divers to do the job. Houthi divers were not very well trained, all of their equipment was commercially available, they just carry one assault rifle, the AK-74M, not the 47, the 74. Very basic weaponry, they are not very well trained, but they have something important, which is a lot of experience working in their own waters, a lot of experience placing mines, a lot of experience, even in some cases, infiltrating in enemy ports. Even if the Houthi combat diver is somewhat amateurish, he makes up for it with courage and experience. For example, remember that the fuse of a mine is a delicate device. If you don't handle it properly, it can provoke a mortal accident. That is to say that Houthi divers must know their job well. Equally striking was the occasion when those divers were able to capture a Remus 600 underwater drone, a device that some warship was using to inspect the water in order to find mines. At least, that is very likely or it could be investigating the seafloor. What about offensive mining? Usually people think of mining as a defensive weapon, right? I place my mines in front of my coast, in front of my port city in order to avoid the enemy from coming in. But I can also use them offensively. How? I will place mines in the door, in the entrance of a port, right? I will place the mines in the middle of a line of communication, of a supply route. And that's how they attacked some of the American traffic that was moving through the Bab el Mandeb Strait and the Re Yemeni Red Sea. On the other hand, at least there was one, I, I don't remember well if it was a corvette or a minesweeper, but it got destroyed from the Emirates, it got destroyed in his own dockyard in the port of Mocha. There it is probably an action from the divers of the Houthis who were able to come close to the ship, place on the hull of it small explosive charge that destroyed it in the dockyard and, you know, the Emirates had to abandon it as, as far as I know. Such operations were carried, we don't know to what extent there is not a lot of reports, we don't always know the, the causes of damage of an American ship or a military ship. Sometimes there is just no evidence of, of such actions, but it is sure that a lot of them happened. But our story didn't end there. The Houthis asked their Iranian godfather for support and ended up receiving the dreaded Chinese C-801 or C-802 anti-ship missile system. The C-801 could be coming from the Yemen Navy, they were able maybe to modify it and use it from the ground. Remember, for example, that during the Falkland War, the Argentinians were able to use their air-launched exocet missiles, they were able to change them, to modify them in order to use them from land. It is a second-generation missile, this means that it is faster, it is not as big 
big as, for example, the Termit missiles. It has also a smaller warhead, you know, for example, the Termit may have half a tone, while this is just a quarter of a tone uh, explosive charge. It could be also coming from Iran. The Iranians produce a local variant of that Chinese missile, the so-called Nur, and they may have provided it to the Houthis by transporting it in small parts. You know, I dismantle the, the missile, I get all of the pieces, and I move some of them in one zip, some of them in the next one, and therefore I am able to move a missile without being easily noticed. To fire this kind of weapon, it is necessary to have a firing radar and a specialized personnel. For example, missiles and radars need heavy vehicles whose location must be well chosen in order to get a good radar horizon coverage, while at the same time avoiding to be an easy objective for enemy vessels. C-800s were used near Babel Mandeb Strait. Their biggest prey was the HSV-2 Swift, an Emirati Navy fast supply ship that got destroyed by their strike. The command bridge probably got fired, so all the systems, the radars, the sensors, the communication devices, all of that got destroyed and very probably the crew had to abandon it after trying to extinguish the fire. It is curious that the ship was able to stay afloat even after all of that damage, but it wasn't worth repairing it, so it has been abandoned right now. We, cons we can consider it a destroyed ship. Of convoy consisting of a destroyer and a US amphibious transport was also attacked by a C-800 missile near the Babel Mandeb Strait. However, countermeasures and anti-missile systems saved the Americans. We will go into detail on this incident in a future video. The fact is that the Houthis were not only looking to protect their coast from Arab amphibious operations, but they were also looking for a way to attack merchant ships and warships sailing dozens of kilometers of the Yemeni coast. What about the incident that I spoke about at the beginning of this video, the Medina frigate uh, attacked by a boat bomb? So this was a very fast boat bomb, we are speaking of more than 100 kilometers per hour, it had a very low profile so it wasn't easy to hit it, and I guess that the Saudis didn't know about this kind of threat. I think that this boat was trying to hit the propellers in the rear part of the ship because otherwise why didn't they try to aim at the central part of it? I think that they tried to hit the, the rear part of the ship in order to destroy the propellers and immobilize it which would be, at least from the propaganda point of view, a, a pretty big success. However, generally speaking, the Saudis have been able to react to this threat and this has not happened again. I guess that just by having some heavy machine guns manned on the sides of the ship, you will be able to, to face this kind of threat. The subject of boat bombs is an exciting one, as their use has been evolving. Their climax use has come when Houthis tried to use groups of them to attack ships sailing in the Red Sea. However, in this regard, the Saudis have given a skillful response. Intelligence resources have been allocated to detect Houthi boat bombs near their docks. So the Kingdom's aviation has been tasked to sank them to a great success, as they diminished such attacks until they became almost non-existent. But again, this has forced the Houthis to innovate and adapt. Houthi divers have continued to operate in Yemeni waters and for example they have been able to capture at least one Rimu 600 which is a, an underwater drone. We don't know what status, maybe it just lost the link, it ran out of electricity, we don't know what happened to that UUV, but at least the, the divers of the Houthis were able to get it. Those divers have been very active and maybe they are the cause of some small attacks against the mercant traffic in the Babel Mandeb Strait until nowadays. In fact, Houthi ingenuity has gone so far as to use some old Soviet airborne early warning radars in a completely innovative way. I present to you the SNR-75 Fang Song in anti-ship mode. The Fang Song is a fire control and tracking radar, what means that it is ready to find enemy aircraft and launch and guide a missile against it. How did they use it against enemy ships? Well, maybe this is just a coincidence, for some reason such a big target as a ship can be detected with this kind of radar, at least in, under some conditions. Maybe they have been able to link this old technology to a modern computer, just maybe, and they have been able to create a software that is able to filter all the noise that such an old radar will provoke, will provide you, and they have been able to filter all the, that noise in order to find a big target as a zip. Thanks to their tactics, the Houthis have managed to protect, more or less, their coastline. They have destroyed and damaged a number of warships, as well as Turkish, Russian and especially Saudi mercant ships, thus managing not only to protect their coastline, but also to turn it into a platform to launch naval guerrilla operations. This effort 
has made it possible for the Houthis to receive new weaponry through the sea. Also, an undetermined percentage of the shipments have been intercepted by the patrolling operations of the Arab and US navies. However, Houthis have suffered some defeats. For example, Yemen Navy ships were destroyed by Arab airstrikes. The Hanis archipelago was seized after a Saudi amphibious operation, while the Emiratis managed to launch several successful amphibious raids between Mocha and Hodeida, which served to underpin the ground advance on the later. Well, so that's all. I hope you have enjoyed the video. From my point of view, the Houthis have made something important because with very small tools, very little amount of missiles, of anti-ship missiles, with not a lot of technology, they have been able to guard their coast, even if at some moments the Arab navies have been able to deploy forces to launch raids to launch amphibious operations, as the UAE Navy has done, as the Saudi Arabia Navy has done to a less extent. Generally speaking, they have been able to protect their coastline, to avoid major amphibious assaults against, for example, Hudeida, because it is thought that even they rejected an amphibious assault there. Taking into account the resources they have, we can consider it a relatively successful strategy, at least to a certain degree. But that's all. I hope you have enjoyed this video. It is based on some articles that I wrote in Spanish, uh, I hope the, they, they are called the Naval Warfare in Yemen. I am a PhD candidate on, on, on insurgency groups, innovation uh, processes, which I, it is very interesting for me. And that's all, I, I hope you are enjoying these videos. I hope they really provide you with something different in, in YouTube. And overall, again, I'm sorry for my English, which I know is not the best. It is far from being the best, but uh, still, I hope it is enjoyable for you. And for me, of course it is. Uh, so that's all. If you want to support me, I will leave you my Patreon and some links below. And, and that's all. Enjoy overall the video and thank you for being here. And now see you in the next video.